Here we are at part four of the only thing you need to know about an active shooter with Ed Monk. Now, listen, I, I get tons of response from a lot of the content that comes here. I haven't had this much concentrated response on people responding to the information that Ed is putting out and the way he's putting out. It is very refreshing. So I'm glad you're seeing this. I'm glad you're putting the time in to actually watch this content. So listen, I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's get right into part four. One of the things that really came through on this, you, your math is obviously indisputable. Um, organizations, like uh, especially government organizations, like schools, especially, that, that's going to be a tremendous challenge. And, and I understand yeah. that. You know, some are, you know, I, my, my wife is a, uh, she's now a deputy chief out here in um, Las Vegas uh, with Metro. And she was the, uh, when she was a captain, she was the on-site commander for uh, the response to, uh, to the, uh, you know, uh, Route 30, uh, Route 91 um, shooting that we had out here. Um, well, she, I, I'd love to have a conversation with her. She has a whole presentation that, that she, and I think you guys should talk because I think they could use a lot of, of, of your uh, uh, information. The interesting thing there, you know, she had to literally identify everybody with the coroner on, on the walkthrough on that and just uh, horrific. Um, but you saw how quickly things happened and it was just, it was just amazing. Um, the, I don't think people understand. I think they, the emotion, I think it gets away from people. And I think it's very easy in a, in an environment, especially when you have zero um, understanding of, of firearms and how quickly things can happen. The interesting thing for me was not only was having an armed response, you know, counter, you know, counter to counter, very interesting. It was the fact that this data you have on shooters once they meet resistance um, and, and how quickly a lot of them shut down, you know, it's not always that way, but what can a, a business owner obviously is a different entity and um somebody there and that's where I, I see a lot of people after seeing this presentation where they don't have to deal with a bureaucracy they, they're dealing with their own business or or a very tight thing i think that's where this can be absolutely compelling for people especially if they haven't thought about this you know and i i deal with a lot of church security teams and uh you know they come and train they train with us and everything and it's amazing you know i at first I was, you know, when it hit me a couple of years because I wasn't really in that world, um, I was amazed how many churches were showing up and getting training, you know, not just in, you know, the hand to hand training that they get, you know, that we get, but also our firearms aspect of things on that and the effectiveness of it and your data just there on, on the effectiveness of that and um, the idea of, of getting to the parking lot, I think is so key. And how, how are you finding when you educate church teams? Um, are, are you finding positive responses to, to going out to, to be more proactive in the parking lot area? Yeah, so the, the history for me on that was up until Sutherland Springs, which was the one in Texas uh, where the guy went in the church and shot 46 people before he was uh, shot by an armed citizen. Before that, I don't know, the vast majority of churches I talked to would say, yeah, you know, we see what you're saying. Yeah, you got a point, but we're not ready. Um, religious, uh, old school, political, it had all, all different reasons, but it was like, yeah, you know, we're just, you know, guns and churches, yeah, God's house. We're just not ready for that. After Sutherland Springs, it changed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every single church from then on, and I wouldn't say every, but the vast majority, and man, I spoke to a lot of them. We have an arm team, we're forming one, or we're talking about it, and we're going to form one. So just so people understand, Sutherland was the one where the, uh, the, the, the responsible citizen that shot him, actually, it was, he was not, it was, was he at the church or was he, he was actually outside. I know he, he followed him in a, in a truck. Is it, yeah, the, I mean, the guy went in the church and shot 46. He, he started in the parking lot shooting right. from the park. He shot three magazines right. in the park. Right. And unfortunately, they didn't have a welcoming party for him when he came in there. So he went in there and shot 46 of the 50 people. Well, Mr. Williford lived just a little less than a block away. He did not go to this church, but he knew a lot of people there. And his daughter alerted him to the, the sounds. He recognized them as gunfire. He, he went to his safe, unlocked his safe, took out his 
unloaded AR-15, his unloaded magazine, and what he described as a handful of ammo, which was eight rounds, and ran out of his house barefooted, thumbing the rounds in the magazine as he was running that partial block over towards the church. Got his gun loaded right about when he was at the house next to the church, and that's when the shooter came out. They saw each other in a gunfight suit from uh, Mr. Williford shooting from his neighbor's yard and the attacker shooting from the church parking lot. They, they both shot. Uh, the truck Mr. Williford was behind got hit. The neighbor's house behind him got hit, but he didn't. But he shot the guy uh, four times. Two, the vest stopped. Two got either around or through the vest uh, of the shooter in the parking lot. He then jumped in his SUV and took off. Mr. Williford didn't have a vehicle. He ran over there. But a third, a second good citizen, uh, uh, Mr. Langendorf was his last name, pulls up in a truck, you know, didn't know, he didn't know Mr. Williford, total strangers. You'd think if you saw somebody with a gun barefooted, you wouldn't, you know, but this is Texas. Right. Williford tells Mr. Langendorf, that guy just shot up the church. We got to follow. So Mr. Langendorf lets him get in his truck and they take off. Mr. Langendorf, the driver, gets on the cell phone. 911, hey, he just shot up this church. We're following him and he's in this vehicle. Um, stopped once. They pulled behind him. He took off. Uh, they took off after him again. And he eventually rolled off and drove off the road, went into some grassy area and sat. And we now know he, he shot himself in the head. Yeah. But yeah, Mr. Williford is a hero. He ran towards the gunfire and he effectively stopped the guy. He just, like, like brave cops that arrived, he just got there too late. Yeah. When he, I've seen several interviews with him. He comes to tears about it. He has to live with that. That you know, it wasn't my fault. But when I, as soon as I heard the shooting and realized it and got over there, um, that's the problem. The time delay. Hey everybody. Hey, if you're enjoying this content, please take the time to go to SurviveViolence.com. Give us your email. Allow us to send you and give you a free masterclass on how to deal with the subjects that we talk about on this channel. Also, please join the channel, uh, hit the subscribe button, notification button, and please share this with all your friends. You. you make that so clear uh, on this. Um, you know, I've, d I've done a lot of work. I have a lot of friends in Israel and um, I've worked with the, uh, the IDF. And it was interesting, you know, when they were talking about that, they were looking at it from a terrorism standpoint at that point. And the, then the, I don't think the U.S. Um, you know, population is anywhere near where where the israelis have been for quite some time but what was really oh, interesting yeah. was the knowledge base that they had on recognizing malfunctions recognizing reload opportunities to attack and the idea of swarming the shooter um is very prevalent amongst them and they learned that in, in fact the what i was instructed at the time was that that was that precipitated the advancement of suicide bombers because swarming the shooter became fairly effective to the point to where uh the terrorists weren't 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 satisfied with the results and, and, um, you know, that, that, you know, predicated people, you know, finding other ways to that point. Now I'm not suggesting that the U S population get to that point, but what I thought was interesting was I remember the Gabriella, uh, uh the Gabriella Gifford shooting and the people that took that, that ended up taking him down were three middle-aged people with no training whatsoever. They just merely tackled him. And I remember the woman, uh, was a little, I think pulling a magazine, um, away from him at that point uh, when he was trying to do a reload and it was just you know and when when you interviewed them when the interviews after they were they they were saying things and I'm paraphrasing this but it was made it's basically like we had nothing to lose we yeah. saw that he was going and we just figured we had to do something um what would if you the suggest is wait to be executed or fight and maybe not be executed right you know like I say, a lot of this is picking the least worst of the options. If you only have two options and they both suck, pick the one that sucks the least. Yeah, and you know, you, you make you, obviously math is is the is the, uh, the the hard taskmaster here, and you make it very clear. You know, the if 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 you do measures that emotionally make you feel better, day in day out until the day of the event, or you do things where you you do the politically correct thing the the time the time delays on effective response is just it's just horrific when you think how many people are getting shot I, I had one question just and I hate to be going all over on this but it just it struck me in the parkland I understood that the SRO didn't go in um 
how was he able to stop the cops from going? And you said they, he told them, did he have authority to stop them? Well, kind of. Uh, okay. In general, in my limited experience in law enforcement, you know, the, the cop on scene, he see, he knows what's going on. And so he kind of directs the others that arrive. Unfortunately, Peterson, the SRO, not only said we got shots going off in building 1200, but it, it's, I've got it recorded. I play it at some presentations. He says to other cops that are approaching, do not come within 500 feet of the 1200 building. Stay at least 500 people away. So here we are, you know, Columbine happened and, and every training I've had in law enforcement since Columbine, they all preach, Columbine changed the paradigm. No longer are we gonna wait outside, we're going in. And how many years later, we got a, a SRO telling resp other responding cops, not only not going in himself, but telling other responding cops, stay away, stay at least 500 feet away. I, I don't know why he would do that. Wow. No, you, you know, it's, it's a really difficult subject. And I, you know, second guess, I, mean, I don't mean to second guess people who obviously aren't trained for this or in there. I understand the response, but the organizations really need to, to look at this because this, this is a problem that's not going away. Yes, it's, it's still a black swan event, but there are a lot of black swan events that are happening. And um, I, what I'm looking to get out of this, people that, are, that are, are viewing this, most of them uh, control their own situations as far as, um, as, far, as, far as their homes, their, uh, uh, their businesses, and some of them are community leaders. Some of them have the ability to do this. Your message is very powerful and it's very hard to dispute. Uh, it can only be it can only be uh, thwarted by emotion and hope. And, and listen, I'm going to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. They're well-meaning people. I understand the uncomfortable that a lot of people, especially people that have no um, understanding of, of, of firearms and, uh, you know, force and, and, you know, response times. I understand what they're uncomfortable. You know, the education process is really something to overcome. What are you finding, you know, you made a really good point about the education level of most of the, uh, um, you know, academics that, that are, that are there, they're, they're more than educated to be able to be properly trained with firearms. But I think it's a cultural thing within the academic culture that you're fighting, you're fighting something where there's just a strong, strong aversion to having guns. I understand. Listen, I, my, my children go to school. I have uh, twin daughters that are seven. My, my youngest is um, seven, my son, actually, my oldest son, 26. Now he actually had an active shooter, uh, situation, not a shooter. They, there was a, there was an armed, uh, an armed, uh, assailant that jumped over and went through the school area to where they had, to, they had to go in. Um, why, why do you think that there's such an aversion to, to have the, the response be fight first, put that up primary. Um, because of course, that's the that's the thing that is going to get you the, the the best result as far as stopping casualties. And yet, you know, the way the government does put out these things, I've seen some horrible, horrible trainings that they that they do. They 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 really really discourage the fight aspect of it. Oh yeah, and I'll just give you a couple of stories that came to mind when you said that. I was given a presentation at one school, and as soon as I talked about. Uh, and not, not even having guns, but just fighting back and about, you know, lock yourself in barricade and whatever he pushes through that door, you know, hit, break his head, break his skull, break his arm. And the superintendent stood up. So that's it. That's it. Stop right there. We're going no further. We will never advocate violence wow. as a policy in this school. So talking about, you know, 20, 30, 50 of their kids getting shot, but we will not advocate violence. And then I, and this, and the second one was, I, this is the first school I ever taught at. And this guy was a nice guy, assistant principal in charge of uh, security. Um, <laughs> when I said, you know, instead of huddling our kids in the corner, which is normally what they do and, and, and which has got a whole bunch of kids killed in Sandy Hook. Yeah. I said, if, if we're gonna stay in the classroom, then let's have a welcoming party and let's get these kids fighting. And this assistant principal said, oh God, Ed, no, we will never, recommend or put in a policy that we fight because our insurance would go up so it's just it, I, I don't need, i don't have a response for that i, I don't either um well when I, and i was on the first floor i suggested you know if, if if the shooting is down the hall 
you know, not right outside my class, but down the hall, I've got a window. Why can't I break the window open and push my 11th grade kids out the window and let them run to the post office down the road? And this educated, well-meaning guy says, Ed, we can't tell the kids to leave campus. It would take hours to get accountability up. And I remember thinking, well, yeah, you can account for them when they're dead on the floor. You know, all the kids in that second room of Sandy Hook were all on the floor. It's easy to account for them right there. But that accounting for kids is not the problem. Yeah. Saving lives is the problem. We'll account for them soon enough. And if you account for them and they're alive, the parents won't really care that you couldn't account for them for an hour or two. But when you, when, when you see the, you know, the disturbing thing is when you see that presentation, it's Parkland is a fantastic demonstration. Well, I, you know what I mean by fantastic. I mean, it shows everything that could possibly probably go wrong. The fact that I didn't recognize, you know, the first time I heard your presentation, for some reason, it's it skipped over me that that was a rifle bag he was carrying. Cabela's, had Cabela's. In yeah, order on I saw control. that. I saw the Cabela's tag on it in that he walked right by an SRO that knows this guy's history, this kid's history. I mean, any kid walk, I don't know of any place you know, in any of the schools that the, that my kids have gone to that anybody could walk on with a, you know, a rifle bag like that and not be challenged or not at least, you know, have some sort of an alert. This is just, that's just mind blowing that oh, that, that was the situation. It is. And, and, you know, most people, Parkland happened, the politics blew out of, you know, just crazy AR-15, all this stuff. And then it kind of went away. Well, then the lawsuit started to cause all these depositions and we just keep learning more and more and more about it most people don't know yeah yeah no, no, that, that's that's amazing listen you know it, it was a horrible tragedy and and all of these are and, and it should not our kids should not have to be subjected to stuff like this at the schools our churches should not have to be subjected to these these crazes but again you know if we're going to make this a political situation where somehow it's it's left and right and you know right and wrong and, and the division that we have in our country right now this is this is a problem I mean, I mean effective response saves lives and you know there there are alternatives and when you look at the math as you you know just put out in very compelling way there's no there's, there's no question. Okay, folks, that's it for that segment of the interview. Hope you're enjoying this multi-part series. We'll be posting more content soon. And until then, please remember, go to surviveviolence.com. Give us your email address. Get your free master class. Make sure that you join this channel. You know, the Tim Larkin channel is growing really fast, but I need your help. So not only subscribe to the channel, hit the notifications, but more importantly, share it with your folks. Let them see one video that particularly got to you. That would really, really help us as we are growing the channel. Until next time, all the best.